morning, everybody. Um, as uh, she mentioned, we've been working on the regional care organizations for the last four and a half years, and that was going to be my topic this morning, but we had to switch it quickly to care coordination. As many of you know, um, we are no longer going to be doing the regional care organizations, so stay tuned as Medicaid pivots in a new direction and makes a determination on where we're going to go from here. There's not much I can tell you about that right now other than that we are, uh, the commissioner's talking to stakeholders and uh, partnerships with hospitals, with sister agencies and so forth. But as many of our programs continue, all of our programs will continue. And today we're going to be talking about the health homes and the care coordination and the partnerships that we have with some of you all. So our agenda today is going to be talking about the history of the health homes, um, what started it here in Alabama, as well as the federal guidelines that we had to go with, our care coordination services, and then the quality initiatives that we have that go along with that program. The health homes actually started with the Affordable Care Act. You know, we often think that Alabama did not do anything that was related to Obamacare, but we actually did, and that's where the health homes came from. They were part of the Section 2703 of that Affordable Care Act, and the whole idea was to integrate the medical services, behavioral health services, over the lifespan of a patient's life. So first we're going to talk about those federal requirements and then talk about what Alabama has embraced in that. We could take from all of it or we could take from a little bit of it. So the services that were included with this, uh, with the 2703 and the Affordable Care Act were com comprehensive care management. And that is the care management that the physician provides. The physician has to make sure that all of their recipients get the care they need through referrals to specialists through the health homes or public health and getting care coordination, which leads us to the next item for services, and that's care coordination. We're going to be talking about that extensively, but that's helping to eliminate those barriers of care that our recipients have. I know many of you, if you're working in uh, with some complicated cases, that can be very complicated with care coordination too. There can be a lot of barriers with that. The next service that the federal government required was health promotion. It, it's not helpful to provide them with resources unless you help teach them on their medical condition. So part of that is that health promotion and teaching, about, teaching them about their diagnosis, how to maintain that, and how to have a better quality of life. And then there's comprehensive transitional care and follow-up, and that's something we had not done over the years. I've been a social worker now that I, th I think that information is a little old. I'm now closer to 30 years of experience, and my first job was in discharge planning. And when we did that, we would provide that. We'd get the equipment, the home health services, everything set up, and as the patient walked out the door, we just held our breath and hoped that everything would work out well. Well, now we go beyond that with transitional care services, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Patient and family support. Um, federal guidelines rec uh, didn't recommend, they told us that we needed to do family and patient support and that we needed to see what the family needs, what support sy systems are in place, and what do we need to do to put those uh, support systems in place. And then of course referrals to community and social support services. So what were the federal requirements for this program? You had to have two or more chronic conditions one chronic condition and be at risk for a second one, or you can have a serious and persistent mental health condition. That would also include substance use disorders. In Alabama, CMS commented to us, and unfortunately it was, it was true, that most of the people with a chronic condition qualified, even with that one, because they were at risk for a second because of the obesity problem in this state. So if you had one at chronic condition, just living in Alabama puts you at risk for obesity, unfortunately. And so many of our patients qualified because of that. 
the chronic conditions for the, red, the federal guidelines, you can see um, the list there. It's not many, but I want you to compare this to what I'm going to show you in just a few minutes that we have in Alabama. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see they're the chronic conditions. But the key to this is that states may request additional diagnoses. You'll see in our list, we took all of these and added quite a few more of the chronic conditions. And I applaud Alabama for doing that because there are so many more chronic conditions than what the federal government suggested that we do with the health homes. So let's talk about the health homes in Alabama. When did they start and what are we doing now? They actually started the year before the state plan, state plan amendment was approved by CMS. It started in 2011 with the patient care networks. But even if you go back further than that, uh, it really started with public health and care coordination. Public health has been doing care coordination initially with the medically at risk program around the year 2000 and forward. So public health has actually been doing a lot of this care coordination for the past 17 years. If you go back even further than that with ED waiver and maternity, 25, 30 years. But that was the start of it. And then in 2011 with the patient care networks. The patient care networks were approved for the state plan amendment in 2012, but that was just a small portion of the state. It was 21 counties, um, and they were spread throughout. There was a, um, a patient care network in the Huntsville area, Tuscaloosa, Mobile, and Auburn. So we think about it, 67 counties, that was really only a third of the state. After three years, we went statewide with the program in 2015. So now everyone across the state can receive health home services. That is not to be confused with home health. Uh, CMS, lacking wisdom in a better name, called it health home, and we're often confused with home health, but let's not confuse the two. So what are our diagnoses? Well, you see the ones listed here. These are the ones that are in the previous list. Um, substance use disorder, I think they combined with the mental health in that. But if you go any further, you can see we have additional diagnoses. We have HIV, cancer, cardiovascular, COPD, sickle cell anemia, which is part of uh, the newborn screening, transplants, and since then, we have also um, added hepatitis C. And that was added when we went statewide in 2015. So if you have any of those diagnoses that we just went through, and knowing that we're at risk for obesity in Alabama, um, you qualify for health home services if you have patient-first Medicaid. Okay? So what are the strengths of the health homes? Why has this been a successful program? Well, first off, we are driven by uh, implementing initiatives through data analysis. We are really beginning over the last five years looking at data across our state, and the data that we can actually collect at Medicaid is claims data. We look at that very carefully on who are our most expensive patients and what can we do. Are these patients that we can impact? There are some expensive patients that we will never be able to drive down the cost. A good example of that is hemophilia. But there are a lot of patients that we can drive down the cost by giving them the, the resources that they need. So we look at that at the state. We also look at that at the health homes and what's going on in their areas. What are the unique problems that they have? It's a statewide collaboration of networks, but it's regionally unique. Things that are going on in Muscle Shoals and Florence their health issues are probably going to be different than what you have in Birmingham and Mobile. So it's not a cookie cutter process. We don't have all the health homes working on exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. They look at what's going on in their regions, and not even just in their regions, but what's going on in certain locations in their regions. We've gotten so large in Region D, which is um, based out of Auburn, but it includes Montgomery, Dothan and Selma. You can imagine that's about a third of the state. It's 21 counties. Well, what's going on in Selma is probably different what's going on in Montgomery. So that health home really looks at it on not even just their region, but also individual locations in their region. So they were able to um, 
think outside the box and look at what they need to do. They have dedicated and committed staff that is embedded in their area. Not only do they hire staff, they also use a lot of the ADPH social workers that have been doing this for a very long time and have been committed to this program for quite some time. And then another strength of ours in Alabama is we are one of the largest health homes in the nation. Actually, we're one of the three largest health homes in the nation. I'm not sure which one's largest, but the three largest is Alabama, North Carolina, and New York. Many of the other health homes are much smaller because they don't take all of those diagnoses or they don't add to them. I've seen some health homes across the country that just use substance use disorders or mental health or they may just take one of those diagnoses and work with it. But Alabama embraced all of it <clears throat> to work with all those diagnoses and um, additional diagnoses. So this is a busy slide. I hope you can see it, but um, we'll describe what programs that we have with the health homes. Um, first, we have care coordination, and that's traditional care coordination that you're probably familiar with in that a licensed social worker or a nurse, which in the case of the, our health homes is a BSN, goes into the home or sees them in the hospital, does a psychosocial assessment to see what their barriers are, what are their strengths, what are their needs, how have they coped in the past, and encouraging them to cope that way in the future. What are the things that they need? Are they financial? Are they social? Do they have enough support within their family? Do they have transportation? Do they have food in the home? Are they having to decide between paying for medications that they can't normally get through Medicaid and paying for food and so forth? And then those social workers and nurses um, follow that patient for as long as they need to. There is no time frame. It's not like you have to go in, be done in six months and be gone. Sometimes they follow these patients for two or three months. Sometimes they follow these patients for two or three years to make sure that they have the services that they need. And then there's the transitional care program, and this is what I talked about earlier. And it's new to Alabama, and it's new to me as a social worker, but something I'm very excited about. They partner with discharge planners in the hospital or wherever you're transitioning. You may be transitioning from a rehab service to home, a physical rehab, um, a residential setting, coming back home but it's to help you transition to whatever that next step is in your life. Usually it's a hospital and our nurses and social workers will visit the recipients who are about to come home from the hospital, make sure they have what they need, make sure they have the medicines they need, make sure they're being prescribed medicines that Medicaid will pay for. Um, I'm sure many of you are from hospitals, I know the people at my table are, and many of those doctors are hospitalists who aren't familiar with what Medicaid's uh, will cover for medications. So we educate the physicians out there. You know, there may be another medication that's just as good, but it's something Medicaid will pay for. And so we take care of that as well when we're there and working with hospitalists, discharge planners, and nurses. And then once that recipient goes home, there's a certain timeline that the health home has to get out in the home, make sure they have their medicines, make sure they picked them up, make sure they're taking them, making sure that they understand what is needed to take care of themselves. And then if they need ongoing care coordination, then the social worker comes in and goes from there, or the nurse in providing care coordination. So that's a piece that's been missing in our health care system, I, I feel nationwide, that is very important is that transitional care. Behavioral health is another component of that. We have behavioral health nurses um, that have been in the uh, in this field for quite a long time, so they understand the medications, they understand the challenges that are going forth, and they make sure that that patient is linked up to community mental health centers, follow-up services, and so forth. But not only that, they make sure that that medical component is tied in with the behavioral health. Oftentimes in our state and across the country, I spent a long time in Tennessee and it was no different there, the medical component doesn't understand what the mental health is doing and vice versa. There was very little communication there, but it was critical because you have medications on both sides. You want to make sure that they're following their appointments. 
um, the health home in Auburn discovered that many of their mental health patients were keeping their mental health appointments, but they had not seen a provider, uh, a PMP, for years. So they got them in for that medical appointment. I always thought it would be the other way around, but they had not seen a physician. So they made sure that that was taken care of. And then the physician and the mental health center were communicating to see what was best for the patient. Another key component for the health homes is pharmacy. Um, the pharmacists look at all of the medications that our recipients are on to make sure there aren't any adverse reactions of the medications, and you would be surprised what they have found. They have found prescriptions that were written incorrectly. They found one doctor gave one prescription, one gave another, and there's adverse effects. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads that they see that. Well, our pharmacist catches that and talks to the patient themselves, goes out and makes home visits, or works with the nurses and social workers to make sure that they're getting what they need. Our health homes um, have actually saved lives by doing this. You would, you would be amazed at the lives that have been saved by having that component of the pharmacist. It's also saved Medicaid a lot of money because they've been on medications that they didn't necessarily need to be on. Beyond this, um, these positions and these services, which are the ones that are required for the health homes. The health homes have also developed other services beyond the scope of what we've asked them to do. One of the big ones is dietitians. Most of our health home programs now have dietitians either by contract or full time who help educate recipients on what they need to do, not only adults but children. Our health home in the Huntsville area has actually had a summer camp for children that have struggled with their weight. Um, they had the football coach from A&M up there come and talk to them, and it was, it was a great success. And these children now are learning better ways to be healthy and make good choices for what they eat. So how does this benefit the providers? Some of our care coordinators are embedded in physicians' offices in mental health centers and in hospitals, and it's certainly helpful to them. It's nice to have a social worker or a nurse right there so that when a patient comes in and there's problems, they can see them. There's a large pediatric practice in Auburn that actually has two full-time care coordinators there five days a week, and they have kept them quite busy. Some of our smaller offices, they may not be full-time, but they may be there one or two days a week or one or two afternoons a week, but it's been very helpful to them to have that service actually in their practice. It's an integration of medical and behavioral health, which we discussed about, we discussed earlier to make sure that those providers understand what's going on with them in the behavioral health world as well as what's going on now. And then beyond that, there's a requirement of our providers to um, network locally. They have to attend quarterly medical management meetings, and in those meetings, they look at that data. They look at what's going on. Um, two of our medical directors in the state, Dr. Smalley and Dr. Thodakura, have said, we thought our practice was running smoothly. We thought we were doing really well with EPSDT until we started having these medical management meetings, and Dr. Smith down the street was doing a whole lot better than us. And so they have figured out how to be more efficient and get those patients in and making sure that they're getting what they need in services. So many of our physicians have changed how they have their practices because of these medical management meetings, because of the data that we give them. And then it frees up their time. If you have a care coordinator there, making sure that they have transportation, making sure they're getting into their appointments, or even understanding those medical appointments, it really frees up the time of the medical staff uh, in that physician's office. Another thing those care coordinators can do is they can actually go to the doctor's appointments with their patients so that they can reinforce what the physician says and they can make sure the physician understands what's going on. Sometimes patients get in and they're so overwhelmed they don't know what questions to ask. And so the care coordinator can be there to be an advocate for them while they're in there with their provider. We have coordination of care with our sister agencies. Uh, community mental health centers has been a key factor in that. Um, we have care coordinators embedded with them, and we work very closely 
behavioral health is one of our huge issues in the state and is a high percentage of our, especially our adult population that have a behavioral health diagnosis as well as a chronic condition. So we have partnered with them in many ways, one of which is embedding um, patient, our care coordinators in the mental health center. But we've also looked at how many of them need medical care, how many of them need to go to the doctor. Tuscaloosa had an initiative where and you have Bryce Hospital there, and so you had a lot of mental health patients coming out. They needed a follow-up in two weeks, but they were on a waiting list and couldn't get in. So what happened? They would be discharged from Bryce Hospital and get a two-week supply of medication, but their appointment was in four weeks. So they'd run out of medications. What happens then? They go back in the hospital. Well, that doesn't help anyone. So they actually contracted with a psychiatrist to give those follow-up appointments to those patients, paid for it themselves out of the money that they received from Medicaid, so that they didn't end up back in the hospital. So they were able to do some overflow of that, make sure that they had the medications they need so that they then could have that follow-up appointment. And it was better for the patient, and it saved the state a lot of money. We've always had a strong relationship with the Department of Public Health, Many of our care coordinators actually come from public health and work with the health homes in providing those services. The one thing that has stayed with public health and the health home services are not providing is making sure that uh, newborn screenings, if anything comes from them, that the public health social workers are out there and making sure that the families have what they need, whether it's hearing, whether it's metabolic screenings and so forth. So they are a key component to much of what you're going to be talking about today in newborn screenings. We have a close relationship with Children's Rehab Services. Um, our care coordinators, if they discover if public health or the health homes discover that there's a problem there and they need to get in, um, they have a diagnosis, you'd be amazed at who falls through the cracks. Um, they make those appointments with Children's Rehab Services. And then there's other resources, such as community food banks. Two of our health homes actually have their own food banks at their facilities, at their offices. They discovered that these food banks have food that's not as healthy as our patients should be. And so they have actually developed their own food banks with nothing but healthy foods for our recipients. And then Family Resource Center, which is a catch-all for everything, and we've always encouraged them to partner with them. Not only do, does the health home provide services to their recipients, but we also have quality initiatives that we look at. Again, it is data-driven. We make sure that people are getting the care they need, but it's also about population management. It's not about only providing care coordination for those individuals in these regions and in these communities. It's also about population health. How can we improve that population? Is it talking to our pediatricians in an area about asthma and deciding what that asthma action plan is going to be and making sure that they're giving that to their recipients? Is it making sure that we have our follow-up appointments with psychiatric care or working on obesity by having some classes going on somewhere? Um, in Huntsville, they did a big thing about fluoride to improve dental care. It's not one of the diagnoses, but that certainly impacts health. And so they look at that data and they develop these quality initiatives. Again, they're regionally based, um, they're data driven, and then they emphasize providing access to care, healthy living, and quality of life. Not only does it help the communities, it helps the patients, and it also helps our bottom line for medical care. If we can be preventative, obviously it's going to save money down the road. So what are some of our initiatives that we've had? We've talked about psychiatric follow-up, um, EPSTD, EPSDT visits. Many of our recipients are behind, and so we have given them, well, their health homes have given our physicians how many of those patients that they have, those pediatric patients, how many of them are behind on their EPSDT visits? And we've been able to help them decrease that by contacting those recipients, making sure that they have uh, transportation to get to where they need to be, 
asthma education, nutrition education, we talked about that, and then sickle cell. That's one of the um, things that is screened for that you're talking about today. And they evaluate those needs, look at the ED utilization. One thing we're really looking at now is transition to adult care. Health homes have been talking to their local sickle cell community action programs and discovered that that's a huge issue. Mama's been there to take care of them and make sure that they're getting medicines and then suddenly these patients turn 21 and if you've ever had an adult child you know they think they know everything there is to know at that point and know a lot better than mama and that's when they start going to the hospital more. So we're really looking at adult transition to care for our sickle cell patients. And then diabetes and barriers to care. Do they have diabetic shoes? Do they have the medications they need? Do they have the nutritional education? So what's the referral process? What if you're seeing someone, you're not sure what to do, you know you need a care coordinator, how do you refer to where you are? Well, we receive referrals from community agencies, we receive them from physicians, we receive them from looking at our data. We look at some of our highest cost patients and refer that way. Sometimes Medicaid finds them. I had just sent a referral to a health home the other day of a high cost recipient. So referrals should be made, on, and I did not correct this, we no longer have probationary OCO operating health homes, they're just health homes now. Um, so referrals can be made that way. They do not have to have a physician's order. Years ago, we used to have, a physician, have to have a physician's order through the medically at risk program, but that was one of the barriers to care. So we no longer have to have a physician's order for that. But the physician is a key part of that. They are part of that health care plan. And the care coordinators, the nurses, contact the physician, and they are part of the development of that plan of care. So what are you going to need when you make that referral? It is helpful to have all of this information, address, date of birth, diagnosis. Uh, most of you are from a medical facility, so this will be helpful. Um, I had to give a referral the other day to a health home because it was a, a complicated patient we were seeing in our data, and all I had was an address. Um, we couldn't even, they were not assigned to a physician, so we couldn't go that way. We didn't have a phone number. But they actually tracked them down with the address and went from there. So if you don't have all of this, it's okay. But if you do, it's very helpful to have. We did have the Medicaid number, too. So where are your probationary RCOs? Um, we are still going by the regional care organization regions that we have. Um, I'm assuming we will in the future as well because everyone's aligning up to that. Um, but we have six RCOs. We have five regions and we have six health homes. Two of them are in Region A, which is your Huntsville, um, I call it the northern tier part of Alabama. And that goes all the way from Muscle Shoals over to Jackson County. And they are Alabama Community Care, Region A, which is based out of Huntsville and is primarily um, led by Huntsville Hospital and their direction. My Care Alabama is also in Region A and that is supported by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Then you go down to Alabama Care Plan in Region B and that would be, it goes up to DeKalb all the way down to if public health people, that's a lot of your Area 6. So that would be, um, I, it, I've been away from public health for four and a half years and I still think in areas and so um, that would be like your areas five and six and Jefferson County in area four. So that's your Gadsden, Birmingham, Fort Payne area and Anniston. That is with Alabama Care Plan through Viva. And of course, many of you know Viva is part of the UAB system. Then in Region C, that's a lot of your, um, it's your Tuscaloosa area and a lot of rural counties north and south of there. And that is with Huntsville Hospital, Region C, as well as DCH. And you can see the contact people and the phone numbers if you need to call them. Region D is Care Network of Alabama out of Auburn. Um, and it is part of Viva, but has a lot of strong roots with EAMC as well. Region D has, you can see it's much bigger than any other region that you have. That's the one with those 21 counties. And then Gulf Coast, they still call themselves Gulf Coast Regional Care Organization. That was their legal name. 
and that is the Mobile area and surrounding counties. So if you have some recipients that you don't think are connected to where they need to be, this is a good direction to go is um, calling your health homes. It's also a good direction with the, meta with the screenings that public health gets involved. So they may also be involved and can communicate with the health homes if necessary. So I brought a couple of examples of success stories to share with you in um, seeing how this actually works in action instead of in theory. Um, there was one recipient that was um, referred to the health home who had cerebral palsy. Uh, he was an older child, but he was a child, and he needed to see his orthopedic surgeon specialist every three months but was having difficulty getting there. Missing just one of those appointments really would set him back. He really had to see this physician uh, every three months in Birmingham and needed transportation to, that, to the physician. Well, when the health home, which in this case happened to be Care Network of Alabama, got involved, they got the child hooked up with Kid One Transportation. Because of that, they were able to see the specialist in Birmingham, and this child got Botox injections, which relaxed his legs and gave him much more uh, range of motion. Now the care coordinator is helping this child to get braces so that this child will no longer be reliant on a wheelchair all the time. They will actually be able to walk. Since being linked to the Kid One, this child has not missed any of his appointments. But they went beyond that. The family had recently moved from another county due to domestic violence. And this child was having a lot of outbursts and uh, not coping well. So he had been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and the care coordinator got the child in for mental health. The mother having just moved and having gone through a lot of issues herself also went into counseling uh, with the help of the health home and the care coordinator, but she was unemployed. So they were able to get her in with Alabama Career Services where she is receiving um, some guidance and some education on how to develop a resume and helping her to find a job. Since all of this has happened, no one's missed appointments and they're getting back on their feet and getting counseling and getting the resources they need for this child who was a multi-needs child. Another one that's a little bit closer to home for the audience we have today is there was a patient who was referred that was 18 months old and was behind on their immunizations. The last set of vaccines that they had had was over a year ago and they had only had two sets. So you can do the math on that. With an 18 month old, that's pretty critical. But when the care coordinator went in the home to see what was going on, they discovered that the mother had four children, one of which was only two weeks old. The two-week-old uh, had an abnormal PKU with the possibility of having cystic fibrosis. Again, this mother had no transportation to get back and forth and also needed to get to Birmingham. So they were able to hook, over, hook her up with the NET program and Medicaid and getting vouchers so that her family would be able to transport them. The mother could not do it because she was blind in one eye. Someone had thrown an object and she was no longer able to drive because of her sight. But she was able to get family to do it with the help of the NET program in um, getting the vouchers to pay for the gas to go. Since that time, no one has uh, missed their appointments. Not only has the child who was 18 months gotten caught up with their immunizations. So have all four of the children and the child that needed the care um, through Birmingham with their abnormality on their PK, PKU test, that child is getting the care that they need in those regular appointments where they have to drive over an hour away. So those are two of the success stories with the health homes. Um, and you can see that it makes an impact, not only on children's lives, I brought children's cases today, but also with adult lives, with the parents, the families that they have, um, and the care that they receive. Beyond that, they also are successful in providing a healthier community in which we live.